This is the Note Closer Show, where you get the latest developments in distressed note investing and learn the secrets of how you can control millions of dollars worth of property for pennies on the dollar. Get educated and entertained by someone who has closed thousands of deals and lives to support you in achieving the same. Now, here's your host, CEO of We Close Notes, Scott Carson. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closer Show. As always, I'm your host, Scott Carson, and we are jubilant to be here. I thought I'd use a different adjective to describe today versus excited. We are jubilant to be here today. Now, today's topic is going to be something a little bit different, but there's been some questions asked online. We thought it would be a good subject to come and kind of dive into reverse engineering notes. Somebody asked on one of the Facebook groups the other day, hey, can you reverse engineer a note deal? And what she meant, I think it was Diane Ensminger, so Diane, thank you for asking that, is she was asking, there's a vacant house on my street. Can I reach out to the bank and eventually buy that note? And we get a lot of people that have asked that overwhelmingly, it's like a big question because most people are used to in their neighborhoods, okay? There's an ugly house down the street. It's vacant. It's been vacant for a year, two years. I want to try to buy the note on that one, okay? And the question always comes down to one thing and one thing only. Who's the lender on it, all right? If it's Chase, if it's Bank of America, if it's City, if it's Wells, uh, no, you're not going to be able to buy that note. Now, one of the biggest things you've got to look at is – going to the county records or a lot of MLSs will ha- have the availability that if you pull it up and you click on it, hit the realist report, it will pull up who the most recent lender is. And that's where you look at. Um, you always want to see who the most recent lender is on that thing. That will tell you yes or no, whether you can reverse engineer it. Now, if it's a smaller bank, if it's a regional bank, you may have the opportunity to do this. Now, <sighs> reverse engineering is going to be more successful in longer foreclosure states than short states like Texas. Okay. Now I'm wearing a Texas cap today because I actually got started doing notes off of doing some short sale deals in Austin. Now I had to get outside of Austin or especially outside of Texas to do a a lot more note deals. Otherwise I would have starved trying to do it. So I wanted to go through how effective if you use short sale listings as a way to reverse engineer note deals. Now, once again, it all comes down to that one thing. Who is the underlying lender? If it's a bank, America Chase, Citibank, the really top five, top 10, they're not gonna sell you the note. You're not even likely not even get a hold of the right person in the secondary mortgage, you know, the secondary marketing side of things. And if you do, they're gonna want to sell it as a large tranche or a large pool of 10, 25, $50 million. They're not gonna sell a one-off note. Now, that's not saying there aren't smaller regional banks or smaller lenders that will allow one-off sales, okay? But it all comes down to finding out who the lender is. And oftentimes, you wanna use that house or that ugly piece of property or whatever as your foot in the door to the asset manager, the secondary marketing manager, maybe not for that specific asset, but for their list of assets all across the country. That's the big nugget I think a lot of people miss. They get so focused on that one house at 123 Main Street, they fail to realize there is a lot more (laughs) uh, upstream, uh, a lot more deals they can tap into if they just do something smart. So let me give you a couple examples on a couple of things we did. I've been buying notes for years, been buying notes direct from banks. And one of our earlier clients that I was buying notes from was a company called Wells Fargo Financial. Now, that's not the main Wells Fargo mortgage company. Wells Fargo Financial was originally the local kind of neighborhood subprime lender. Okay, they did a lot of signature loans. I actually almost went to work for them out of college, which is kind of funny. Bless you, Nicole. We got hay fever running around here in the office today. Um, And so... We were buying, I was buying one-off notes from Wells Fargo Financial, and I had my asset manager there, Steve Smith, okay? Well, Wells Fargo Financial is no longer around. They've been absorbed. They're they're no longer around, so that's why I can tell you the story. So Steve was my asset manager. He would send me literally lists 
and lists of deals that they were looking to get rid of, subprime stuff, you know, 70, 80, 100 assets that I could pick up for literally nickels on the dollar. I mean, the biggest regret is I didn't buy the whole tape, okay? Looking back at what I know now, I should have bought the whole thing, but I was able to get cut my teeth and start on it. So I was buying one-off notes from Wells Fargo Financial. So what we did, my partner at the time was a real estate agent here in town. We jumped on the MLS and we looked for anything that was listed short sale with Wells Fargo Financial. Now, if you don't have a realtor, one of the easier things you can do is many times you can purchase a pre-foreclosure list, okay? A notice of default list, okay? In your county that they often will sell, you know, once a month, it's anywhere from like 35 to $55 a month to get that list of foreclosures or pending foreclosures. And one of the great things that often these lists will show you if you're buying it, especially in Texas, we have uh, the Roddy List or Foreclosure Listing Service is a good one that it literally kind of tracks the top 15 counties in the, in, the, uh, in the state. And it tells you, okay, tells you the address, the borrower, the estimated unpaid balance, the fair market value, bed baths, legal description, and then who the, the lender is on it. And, you know, other things on it. And then it also will give you, there's one column if it was a previous listing. Now, if it's a previous listing, it's probably a listed short sale. Because in Texas here, since we can foreclose so quickly, okay, if it's a, if it, you know, it will show up on a previous listing a lot of times. They'll drag it out, it's listed on the MLS, realtors got offers pending on it. Banks taking, you know, three to six, nine months to literally get an approval process. Now, that's not in today's numbers. I'm just giving you an idea, kind of background. So we pull this list and we start checking lenders on it. And then we see Wells Fargo Financial pops up on it. So Wells Fargo, we see this listing. I pick up the phone. I call Steve at Wells Fargo Financial. I say, hey, Steve, Scott Carson here. Just want to talk with you. And we closed on the deal last month. I wanted to see if you might be able to, if you guys would be willing to sell this one note here in Austin, Texas. And actually, there's three. There's three listings with Wells Fargo Financial that were on the foreclosure list here. And it had been listed on the foreclosure list for about nine months, this one, especially 9016 Columnfield Drive. Okay. And he goes, well, I would take, uh, yeah, I think I, I, on the three, that one in Columnfield Drive, I can sell that on too, but I need a bid from you. I'm like, okay, well, give me a day. So quickly, jumped in the car, ran over. Since it was on the MLS, what does that give you access to? Well, it gives you inside access. It gives you interior photos. It also tells you the borrower is willing to walk away from the property, right? They're not going to fight you foreclosure. Well, in this situation, the borrower was deceased, okay? And it had taken about nine months for it to go through probate. It was on a corner lot, nice looking house, red brick house, three car garage, but it needs some work, okay? It was outdated. Although it did have, I mean, it was fully furnished inside. It, it was funny, yeah, sorry. Brand new washer dryer, brand new front end loading um, you know, washer dryer that were new at that point versus what they're very you know, old hat now. Stainless steel appliances, but it was just outdated. You can tell that somebody had some money, but they passed on. Well, we walked into the garage and there was this 2001 white Chevy Suburban that was just full of boxes and stuff in the back. Keys were literally on the ignition, it was unlocked. Second bay, was stacked with boxes. I guess the, the person had been into gemstones at all these display cases and other things that, you know, it was just packed full. And then the third bay, third garage, was full of old antiques. Antiques just stacked top to bottom, okay? Um, borrow owed, if I remember, owed about 250 on the asset. It was worth somewhere 200, 220, all right? Um, my realtor, called the listing agent and asked, well, what kind of, you know, offer do you have? How's that working out for you? Um, you know, do you have somebody, you know, you have a strong offer. You know, I have somebody who is interested in putting in, in a cash offering. They're like, no, we've got a very strong offering. They've hung around for a while. They're ready to go on this. Um, and my realtor's like, well, sure, you don't want to back off offering just in case. And she's like, okay, fine, just in case. I'll t we've got an offer basically at 150, okay? 150. And I was like, okay. Hmm, okay. So 150 is the offering on it. Been around for a while. Needs some work, obviously. So we immediately run back and I reach out to Steve and said, okay, hey, and you got to realize it's the bigger the banks are, the short sale department doesn't always talk to loss mitigation. They don't communicate. And loss mitigation is where all the short sales and 
They're trying to collect, 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 right? They don't often track what's going on over on the, the portfolio side. It's often different banking system, different branches entirely, sometimes different states. So we reached out to Steve said, Steve, hey, would you be willing to sell that? No, it looks like it's, you haven't got a payment in over two years. How about 75 grand? Actually, I first offered 50 grand. He goes, no, I can't take 50 grand for it. I said, well, how about 75? He goes, hang on, let me get back to you. He called me the next day and says, yes, we'll accept 75 grand. Woo! Which I'm thinking, that's like about half. You know, we're going to pick this note up for about half of what it really as is worth before we put repairs into it. And, you know, getting it at a substantial discount. And sure enough, he comes back, we'll take 75. So I reach out to my funding partners here in town and say, hey, I got a deal. It's got a cash buyer already lined up at around the 150. We can buy the note for 75 grand. And then turn around and just finish the short sale. So he's the sale to a retail buyer. And my cash investor here locally was like, okay, let's do it. So we buy the notes. The day after we fund the note purchase, we get assigned a contract. I reach out to the listing agent and say, listen, hey, just wanted to give you a phone call. You, I see that the note has sold on this because we're now your bank. And the realtor was upset. She's like, oh, damn all. And the reason she was upset, she spent nine months working this short sale keeping it together. And what happens when realtors put shorts together and things sell, they often start over at square one. And I'm like, well, listen, you don't have to start over at square one. Relax. How soon can your cash buyers close? And I'm like, well, they can close They've been already close. They can do it in 30 days. I'm like, done. Send me the, the, the estimated HUD one so I can see exactly what's in the bank's netting. And I bet you I can get approval on this relatively quickly. And sure enough, after she sent me the HUD, I did a little dance because we we're going to net about 140 on the thing, 145. Um, no, no, no. We ended up at about 135. Now that I think about it. So I said, yep, let's do it. Boom. Do documents and servicing gets transferred to us. We get, we expedite the assignment of mortgage getting recorded and we close about 45 days after we funded, um, for 135 was our net. Now that's a $60,000 profit over the 75,000. Now the borrower on this one is deceased. So they didn't care. We, we basically still forgave a sizable chunk <laughs> Uh, almost, you know, eighty, eighty-five thousand dollars in unpaid balance and late fees we, we forgave on the short sale side. That's how the short side of it was, but we still made money. My funny partner and I split sixty grand. They got thirty grand for a seventy-five thousand dollar investment for basically less than two two months. Pretty good ROI. I made my thirty grand and was pretty happy and danced a little jig for just being a deal engineer and putting it together. Now, we've done that a few times. It all comes down to one critical piece of information. Who's the lender? So do we have any questions from anybody asking about right now? So um, you don't see a lot of short sales these days anymore because values have gone up. I mean, you still see some occasionally. Our, our buddy Matt Marinoff out there is still knocking out some short sales. <clears throat> you can see short sales in an area where the value's good and the property's good. Short sales aren't being that much of a short anymore. You're seeing 90, 95 cents on the dollar and the smaller the bank, the less likelihood they are to take a big short off it because they're, they're not leveraged as broadly. They don't have as many deposits to make up their write-off. So the smaller real, it's like individual one-off, A paper lending banks aren't gonna probably be willing to play ball with you. But you get the regional size, the mid-size stuff, you'll see some stuff. And the beautiful thing is if it's a short sale, if it's a truly listed short sale that's been on the MLS for a while in a state that's longer, for, uh, has a longer foreclosure time than Texas, you're going to probably have a little bit more success, especially in the states like um, South Carolina, Florida, uh, New Jersey. This would be a strategy that would work really well depending on who the lender is. Uh, I want to say, say New York is still a long time to, to get things done there, but it's, it's got some possibilities. Uh, Ohio, Indiana, where you start seeing six to nine months is an opportunity there for you. It's just that you got to figure out who the lender is. That's the most important thing, seeing who the existing lender is, who the newest lender is, and then reaching out to. This is a great strategy that I talked about a couple weeks ago about jumping on your county records and pulling a, a list of assignments, assignments of mortgage in the last 12 months to see what's been buying, who's been buying what mortgages, in your area, whether it's an instantaneous kind of tabletop sale, which happens a lot of times with mortgage bankers, they'll close on a note and sell that note immediately to a, a bigger bank. That happens quite a bit, but you often will find 
uh, funds that are buying and selling mortgages on uh, stuff that's been around for a while, especially if it's in the default side. So questions, comments from anybody? Um, <clears throat> that's really the one way to reverse engineer trying to find note deals in your backyard. Most of the time, they're not gonna say yes to even those local assets, but th they work really well to get your foot in the door, get your toe in the door, to get the conversation started with the asset managers to see about getting on their major list, get the list that they send out on a quarterly, monthly basis for. Like I got a couple emails uh, this last week from a large regional lender, not top 10, uh, who's moving stuff on the residential side. And I was already looking, Googling some of the addresses, to see some of the addresses are listed. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about short sales is you often get into your photos, you get into your access. It's, it's a great thing if you're coming over from the fix and flip side, because oftentimes fix and flippers, that's their biggest, uh oh, what? I can't get inside. I can't see them. Well, what if it needs repairs? You know, you have to look at what the asset looks like as is and, and going from, you know, where it's at condition wise. Now, if the house has been vacant, you, know, you got to be very careful that it hasn't been trashed out. Now, that's not nothing that a size 14 boot hammer can't help, right, Greg? <laughs> you hear that little. <laughs> out there to do things happen. So, I mean, yeah, I have walked so many houses. We were doing a lot of short sales here in Austin. And, you know, like I said, most of them were bank, America, Chase, Citibank. They're not going to really um, move that much stuff when it comes to the paper side to small guys, medium guys. They want to deal with large. I'll give you an example. I had a conversation with the head of Citibank's distressed mortgage side and Adam Rubenfeld a few years back. And he was like, yeah, Call us when you can buy 50 million and you better be expected to be paying somewhere in the 60s, 70s of value on the distressed asset sales side. So I'm not saying you can't make money at that price point, especially in the higher valued assets, you'll have some opportunity there because you've got a, a large stroke of equity. But when you start getting down below 150, you know, you're paying 70, 75 cents on the dollar, it, it's almost too expensive. There's not a lot of opportunity for profits there unless you can upgrade the property quite a bit or you can expedite um, the exit strategy, cash for keys, deed and lose to boost your ROI on an annualized basis versus just a, a short-term basis. So quiet out there this morning, everybody. Now, <clears throat> one of the great things that is good to do um, is, is checking your, with your realtors. If your realtors have a, can give you access to MLS and look for short sales, listen short sales. You know, oftentimes the MLS will say third party approval required or bank approval required. You know, if they have that category in your search criteria, not a bad thing to check out. And then just checking to see who the lenders are by hitting the, the, the lending report or the, it was, we call it here in Texas or other areas, the real estate report. Now, oftentimes the foreclosure lists that we've talked about have dwindled down dramatically compared to what they used to be, you know, three, four, five, six years ago. But if you know this kind of strategy, it will prepare you for later on when the market does start to turn south. And it's doing that in some areas already, especially in the high dollar stuff, okay? I personally believe and feel that the your quarter million dollar houses or less is where you're gonna see the most amount of listings. I mean, you're gonna see some of the high dollar condos and things like that that hit the market looking for short sales, but those are, you know, those are harder to find buyers for, um, especially in, in, in a timely fashion. Um, because the banks are onto it for so much. And, you know, not everybody has a half million dollars to, to write a check or, or cash or fund a deal relatively quickly. Now we have, I've done some large short sale deals before, uh, closed on a condo on a condo. It was a, a very elaborate townhome in Naples before, um, guy owed 1.6. We got him to approve, we got the bank to approve a million dollar, uh, note sale and we sold it for 1.2. Um, one of the first note deals I did back in 2000, golly, it would have been 2007. 2008 was on three condos on the beach in San Diego on Pacific Beach. Gorgeous million dollar developer did an amazing job. And uh, it's out there actually doing kind of a, a two week coaching to buy assets in San Diego years ago. And we, a realtor put us in charge. They, the developer had these three condos at last they had not sold. He was motivated to get them sold and get them sold as fast as possible 
because his bank was getting antsy. And it was the Bank of Arizona. And we were able to negotiate, put them under contract. And then we reached around to the bank and negotiated a short sale. So even a better price for what we had them under contract for. We had a non-exclusive option on the property so that if the guy found a, a cash buyer for him, he could go ahead and move with them. Uh, what was funny is the seller, who is the developer and the builder, was a bit of a shady kind of bastard. <laughs> he kept going, oh, I got I a cash offer. And, Great, let's see the contract. And he could never prove the contract because he was just basically trying to push us to close. Well, you know, it took 30 days, but we ended up closing on these three condos and very, very nice. We actually got the realtor to open it up. We had a beer tasting night in there. It had thousand, $100,000 worth of art in just one of the condos. It was so it was compacted, but two story, telescoping, uh, doors. I mean, literally, if you stepped out of the front door, you were on the walkway in San Diego. You almost get hit by the bikes. And then three, three feet later, you're stepping over the curb and you're on the beach. I mean, immaculate, just absolutely gorgeous places. And um, still look beautiful to this day. I was by there last time I was in San Diego, walked by them, and I was like, oh, here, here the deals are. But, you know, short sales are short sales. They're going to make a comeback. Um, you, you know, if you understand how they work, a lot of times now, short sales have been streamlined. A lot of banks are going to um, a software, I think it's called Equator, that's helping them streamline everything, get everything up and loaded. It's not such a, a difficult process that it used to be, but that's the bigger banks. The smaller banks are still literally looking at their, you know, or the regional banks are still looking at their bottom lines and figuring out what they are into it for and they've done their write-offs, go from there. So one thing to keep in mind, if you're using Distress Pro as a service, you can often see, you know, check out in the banks to see how much they're putting away in reserves every quarter. And then that, fourth quarter when the reserves add up, that's when they're looking to move most of their note sales. Well, that would also be a good good month, a good timing to look at where their footprint is and trying to see if there's any listed short sales in the major metroplexes and then being able to kind of book in both those deals. So questions, comments, concerns, but the, just the biggest thing is you got to have cash on those things to be able to close on the note deals like you would anything else. But it's a beautiful thing to have the end buyer ready to walk. You're not going to, it's not going to be a modification. It's not going to be a reinstatement. It's going to be somebody that's walking from the deal. Now, if you are going to buy a note, all right, buy a note and it's still occupied and the borrower has expressed interest in selling the property in a short sale, a couple things, okay? Two big rules. One, use your own realtor. Make it a requirement that you use your realtor to close because the last thing you want is the buyer or the borrower who's got their best friend Susie or whoever it is who's a realtor there dragging this out who has more allegiance to Susie than they do to use the bank because I have been good in the past of getting short sales extended when we were doing some short sale negotiation for several years for for people okay I've seen short sales last three years four years just get dragged out with temporary restraining orders and new contracts and just dragging it out which is not fun if you're the bank. So that's why if you're buying a note, the, the bar wants to list it for short sale to sell it off, which is not a bad thing. Just make sure two things, like use your own realtor. But the second thing is make sure the realtor does not list the property at full value. That's what will drag things on further than anything else. Oh, we'll list it at full value. Well, it's a short sale. It's a distressed sale. You should not be listing it at full value. You should be listing it at 80, 85, most case 90 cents of value of as is value. Why do you want to list it at the discount? You want to get foot traffic in. You want people to see the property and give them some incentive to hang around for three, six months, you know, three to six months or whatever it takes for a short sale to go through or approval and things like that. Most realtors avoid short sales because it does take nine months for something to close. This is why you want to list it at 85, 90 and say, hey, pre-approval offer. You've got, you can come to it here at this at 85. It's approved to close at that number. And that will happen Will happen when you have buyers that are walking, they see that, oh, it's a deal, it's pre-approved, let me make offers in. So now you've got two people fighting for the deals and it drives the price up. So maybe they start off at 85, well, hey, I need your highest best, so that goes to 87. Okay, well, I'll go to 90, well, I'll go to 92. Well, I'll go to 92 with no contingencies. I'll buy it as is, you don't have to fix anything, okay? And that often works out really, really well because then you're still closing at 90, 92 cents which faster versus trying to list it at 100% of value 
then have to drop the price down, and then give incentives to get it to move. Okay, question. Yeah, George Crocker asked, is it an average time for short sales, or is it all according to the situation? Uh, good question, George. It's all according to the situation. It's all according to really how well you communicate with the bank. Sometimes it takes six months, sometimes it takes nine months. It just depends on how much, how many short sales that bank has. Some of the larger banks have stacks and stacks of files, so it's all, you're at the bottom and you're working your way to the top, and when the short sale negotiator gets to your file, if everything's there, they can make a movement. If there's not everything there, then they got to put it back at the bottom and work way back down to it. So, another question of uh, Brady Dirt is: Have you thought about advanced training on getting contacts on deals or option agreements to include example of contracts? Do you see this as a as a diversion or a shiny object syndrome, or something investors need in their tool belt? I lost. He lost me. Let's, let's ask that question one more time again. Have you thought about advanced training on getting con contacts on deals or option agreements to include examples of contracts? Do you see this as a as a diversion or something investors need in their tool belt? I, I still don't. I, so I guess I, I guess he's asking um, maybe looking to get training to see like short sale agreements or something. I don't know. You want to read it yourself? Let's see here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I still don't get what Brady's. Brady, shoot me a text message, buddy, and we'll put you on speakerphone and have you ask the question directly. All right? Shoot it to me directly. Because I don't know what you're It's like you've got two questions. Right. Contracts or contacts? I'm not, I'm not following what you're talking about there. Okay. That's funny, but it's, I mean, you see, this is a version. Yeah, I don't, he, he's got to explain it. I think he's overthinking it. Mm. With that long a question, I think it's a shiny object center, but yeah, Brady, if you can, shoot me a text message, we'll bring you live hey. on the note closer show and go from there. So um, I, I think honestly, if you're doing anything, you've got to try to avoid shiny object syndromes. 90% um, of what we cover is pretty much everything you need. Now, yeah, there's about 10% of stuff that we just don't go through because it's, I, I could spend forever here doing little segments or little niches of every little thing that go wrong, but you would never get anywhere. You'd be too busy watching videos and trying to learn every niche before they pull the trigger. And my biggest goal in life for you guys is to pull the trigger. You know, you need to know 80, 90% and you figure the other stuff out as we go through and walk you through it and then you go from there. But sitting here and preparing for every possible disaster um, doesn't work. So actually, here's Brady. So let me call him. Let's get him answering the question here. So always kind of fun. <laughs> Never know what you're going to get to the Nicholas show. <laughs> Brady, hang on a second. You got to speak now. Say it again. Can you hear me, sir? I can hear you now. Yes, sir. Okay. So good morning. Brady Dury is known as the mortgage medic is what he calls himself. <laughs> Out of uh, Dallas Fort Worth, you run the Fort Worth Note Closers Group, correct, it, Brady? Yes, sir. We're meeting tonight. Awesome. You're meeting tonight. What time? Uh, Seven p.m. Where are you going to be meeting the, at? Uh, yeah. Say again. Where are you going to be meeting at? Oh, we're meeting at uh, Buffalo West. Buffalo West. What is that? Like a dance hall? Yep. Yeah. A uh, restaurant. They uh, have steak and. Uh, They've got several different rooms, and they're very supportive of the uh, the local uh, military and our, our first responders. Awesome. That's great stuff. So let's get to your question. I didn't quite understand your question. Can you yes, break it down yes, into sir. two parts for me? So, the you know, the, the contract aspect of, of investing, do you think this is something we need to have in our tool belt, how to assemble a contact, how to organize these organize these deals? from the paperwork side. Okay. Are you talking about a short sale contract or just a loan sale agreement? Uh, no, sir. More like um, the, 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 a, I know you had an episode where we talked about um, uh, option agreements mm -hmm. and you, you just mentioned that deal in San Diego, you had option agreements coupled with some other um, creative documents. Well, no, there's, there's, we not, have? there's not really any creative documents when you're uh, mm -hmm. When you're in a note deal, you're doing a loan sale agreement. But if you're doing a, a like a short sale deal, like we just did, there's already a loan. Mm -hmm. There's already a contract in place of you know a, a, a right to purchase contract, a traditional contract from 
an end buyer who wants to buy the property on a short sale, okay, that's an underlying, it's a normal real estate contract, okay? Okay. With me reaching out and getting buying a note, it's just buying, you know, buying on a traditional loan sale agreement. It's just, it's mm. there's two different things. It's kind of booking you. The retail side and have me going behind the shadows, talking to the different bank to buy the note on a loan sale agreement. Now, an option agreement is just, it's like a wholesaling fee or an option agreement, if you're buying the note and put an option on it, you know, um, that's on the retail side with a guy in San Diego. It's just an option agreement. Instead of a loan sale contract, it was an option agreement. And the minute we got the bank to agree to sell us the note, then we put it under a contract, okay? Or I didn't need to put it under a contract because now we had the note at a much cheaper price. So now we can just turn around and sell it and, and make sense. Now, the beautiful thing is once we got the note under co contract and we and, and took our option agreement, we canceled the option agreement and came back with a low rock bottom price based on the loan sale. But this is the seller, in this case, the developer who was the borrower, he was just glad to be done with it, okay? He was at the point where his bank was forcing him to get out. And when they, somebody approached him to buy the note, we're now the bank. So we then allowed the developer to sell it on a short sale to another buyer that we actually brought to the table. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So I don't think you need to spend forever going through paperwork and contracts. I think honestly, if you spend an hour reading through a contract it'll, and asking a few questions is all you need. Um, it's not anything difficult. Uh, your most important thing is to be reaching out and marketing. Your, your most important thing is to be making offers. That, uh, loan sale agreements are not that difficult. And I get a lot of people that come across, oh, I want to, I need to spend time going through paperwork. The paperwork is the least interesting part of it. It's also the thing that I, you need to spend a little bit of time on because most of the paperwork is pretty, pretty generic and pretty you know, uniform across the board. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I know uh, Quincy talks a lot about uh, option agreements and, and, and those things can be um, structuring those deals can be, are fascinating studies and I was wondering sometimes if you think that was more, or more of a shiny object. Well, no, it, it's not. To. It's just that the paperwork is, is not a big deal. It's a, it's a one page mm -hmm. agreement. It's a one page mm -hmm. option agreement. Hey, I agree to buy this note at this side. And what you do, how you structure it with your IRA or what you get to fund at hundred dollars. It's a simple thing. You shouldn't overthink it because you're really only going to be funding an option agreement with a hundred bucks or 10 bucks if you're using your self-directed IRA. So, that $10 is basically the price on the contract or the option agreement to secure it at that price, okay? Now you have a contract that you can wholesale just like you would anything else. Excellent. Does that make sense? Thank you so much for your yeah. time. Yeah, no problem. Great question, Brady. <laughs> you have a plus day. You too, buddy. Hey, get your email out, buddy. You, you need to get an email out this week like we talked about last Monday night. Yes, sir. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you later. All right, that was kind of cool. What other questions? Nothing yet? All right. Well, honestly, that's about what we've got for today. Um, reverse engineering, guys, it's the biggest thing you have to try to avoid. Avoid chasing the shiny object syndrome. Avoid trying to drive around and use all the ugly houses because oftentimes you'll get burnt out because you're spending money and your time and you're looking at ugly houses, then you go back and research it, and most of them are going to be with the major banks who have them in offshore trusts or other things. But calling the banks directly, reaching out and finding out exactly what they need to get off their books, what their nightmare note deals are, or this could be the better way. I mean, you can show up, slay Freddy Krueger, Jason, you know, and, and really make it happen um, by getting their list and, and helping them out. So that's my recommendation, guys. Go out, make something happen. It is, uh, if you're listening on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Music Play, make sure to leave us a review. Feel free to share this with any of your friends or parties are interested if you're watching here live on Facebook on replays, make sure you go out and download the episode or check out our latest list of episodes on iTunes and Stitcher as well. So until we, uh, we meet again, we'll see you all at the top, everybody. Bye.